Hello, and welcome to the first presentation of the spring 2018 season of the Medical History Interest Group. I'm Melissa Nasia, the History Collections Librarian. The Medical History Interest Group presentations are sponsored by the Lopez Library, History Collections, and the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. If you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance sheet before you leave. If you are attending as part of the ECU Wellness Passport Program, please see Lane Carpenter over there um, after the program for your stamp. And refreshments are available over there. Please help yourself. This is the first presentation, so we have three others planned. And on February 26th, uh, Carol Winters of, of nursing will present on Clara Louise Moss, Servant Nurse Leader Undaunted. And then on March 26th, Margaret Humphreys from uh, Duke University will present on Death and Diversity in Civil War Medicine. And then finally on April 9th, Sheena Egan from the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies will, will present on the history of PTSD, how co cultural narratives affect the patient experience. Our current exhibits are on, all on the fourth floor around us. We have a pop-up exhibit on Edgar R. quote, Painless Parker to complement this presentation. Also over there, <coughs> excuse me, is North Carolina in the Great War, medical professionals on the Western Front and scientists and their microscopes. Today's presentation is Edgar R. Painless Parker, vaudevillian dentist, and our presenter is Bobby M. Collins. Bobby M. Collins, Collins, DDS, MS, is a clinical associate professor in the ECU School of Dental Medicine. He is a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist and has a Master of Science in Clinical Medical Education. Dr. Collins has experience in the private practice of dental general dentistry. He served as a dental officer in the U.S. Army and was an otolaryngolic pathology fellow at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center be before joining the, the faculty of the School of Dental Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, where he was there from 1996 to 2011. Dr. Collins is a history buff, a Shih Tzu dad, and hopes one day to have a small zoo. So here is Bobby M. Collins with Edgar R. Painless Parker, Bavillian Dentist. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to talk with you about um, Painless Parker because uh, Painless Parker, at the time uh, of his professional growth, was actually ridiculed because of his practices of advertising and patient education. And it's only recently that you can look around and see that a lot of things that he proposed at the time have become commonplace. Um, we'll call this sticks and stones. He was rejected by his peers for the unethical, pra unethical practice of advertising. He called an outlaw, a charlatan, a quack, a scoundrel, a fraud, a thorn in the side, unprofessional, a flamboyant street dentist, a menace to the dignity of the profession. Um, interesting all this was said about him because uh, advertising in dentistry was actually done in colonial times. There were a number of people who uh, advertised the painless removal of teeth. They were typically wig makers and farriers. Okay, uh, weren't that very many uh, dentists that were formally trained. Uh, here are some quotes. He said, father was a fighter both personally and professionally. At home he was basically kind, sympathetic and considerate. He was strongly opinionated and very protective of his family and personal life which he kept separate from a very public image, and that was his daughter when she was like 90 years old. Uh, he was an advocate of the common man, believed in dentistry, should be accessible to everyone at a reasonable cost, and delivered reliably and with as little um, uh, pain as possible. He was also a showman who loved the public eye, action, controversy, and adventure. He was an outlaw, 
a renegade dentist. Okay? So to understand Parker, you really have to understand the times and influences of the late 1860s. Of course, he was born in 1872. But the Canada Confederation had happened in 1867. And I don't know a lot about that. It's when the British government met with the French government and decided on the, how they were going to parcel out uh, Canada's uh, provinces. And it was also the end of the American Civil War. Uh, Parker was born to a shipbuilding family in a seafaring village of St. Martin's, uh, New Brunswick. Um, he uh, was greatly influenced by uh, P.T. Barnum. And uh, P.T. Barnum, of course, was the wealthiest professional liar uh, and the Prince of Humbug. He opened the great traveling museum, uh, Caravan and Hippodrome, so he could carry his, uh, his acts of circus freaks and dancing girls and uh, this over-the-top showmanship uh, all around the country. Um, in the um, 1860s, Union Pacific joins the Union Pacific Railroad. That connected the U.S. East to West. And then in 1885, Canada would have the same thing. Um, it was the era of patent medicines, which Melissa has spoken with us about before. But if you'll recall her presentation, it showed the uh, patent medicines being advertised by very artful uh, cards to gather your attention. The medicines, for the most part, were largely ineffective. Uh, the ones that were effective had a great deal of alcohol, uh, marijuana, uh, heroin, and uh, cocaine in them. Uh, and I guess effective for actually making you somnolent. Um, the uh, other thing that was a great influence on Parker was the vaudevillian entertainment that was prevalent in the late 19th and early 20th century. And uh, again, that's where you have the song and dance men. Uh, there were various comedy acts. There were various acting troops that would um, travel the country and perform. And if you ever want a flair for that, if you recall TV from the late 1950s and early 1960s, they were largely derived from vaudeville. Red Skelton Show, Ed Skelton Show, things like that. Um, this book is actually one of the references I used for this talk, and it was a gift from Arden Christian. Uh, it always pays to know people. Uh, the two oral pathologists at the Indiana University, uh, Susan Zunt and Lawrence Goldblatt, were good friends of mine. And, um, when I told them that I was looking for Arden, they said, well, he's retired now, but he still comes in. And I said, I'd like his book. And they told him, and he sent it to me. I thought that was very nice. You used to be able to purchase this book at the Samuel Harris National Museum of Dentistry. Uh, you can't anymore. Uh, so here is he, he signed it for me, sent me his uh, CV. He's retired Air Force. He's a consultant to the National Institute of Health. He's always been involved in smoking cessation. And the origin of this book was a uh, fact that he had to teach uh, history of dentistry and ethics uh, his first year at Indiana University. And that put him in the American Academy of the History of Dentistry, where he met uh, Pete Pronich. OK. Um, so here are my references. And that um, American Journal of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics has a, a brief excerpt uh, of uh, Parker's life. This is actually an advertisement for a course that's being offered soon. And you can see they've, they've borrowed some of uh, Parker's advertising techniques. Um, so vaudeville was variety entertainment, popular in the 1880s, 1930s. It had origins in the Greek and French theater. Um, they incorporated uh, saloon and concert hall events, uh, minstrels, they had athletes, they had plays and shows. And uh, these performances consisted of oratory and, like I said, comedy. They had music. Uh, most of the performers actually did multiple things, so they didn't have to carry as many around in the troupe. But they were very clever in the way they arranged things because the slow acts allowed people to come in and grab a seat. And then the more entertaining acts were, you know, clustered toward the middle of the show. Um, the performances were largely over the top, and that was the best way to get the audience's attention. They were bawdy. They were burlesque. 
They used a lot of dancing girls, and Parker picked up on that. Uh, if you use a lot of dancing girls, people will come to your show. We don't have any today, I'm sorry. Um, so here are some excerpts from that American Journal of Orthodontics and or Dental or Dentofacial Orthopedics. Said he was a street dentist, an evangelical, an evangelist preacher, and um, he would uh, sort of profess the benefits of dentistry to a congregant of listeners. Uh, he was based in New York, but he kept a road show, and that was called the Parker Dental Circus. And it had a 15-piece band. It had bugler, bu buglers. It had tattooed ladies, contortionists, the human skeleton, and dazzling dancing girls, scantily clad, I might add. Uh, he lectured on dental health, and then he began his extractions. Now, his extractions were, were done with great, great flair, and what he would do is he would get a confederate, not somebody from the South, but somebody who was a willing participant. And he would palm a tooth, and then he would go through the motions of extraction and then raise the tooth into the air and the person in the chair said, I didn't feel a thing because nothing had happened. So, um, so for gathering patients, that band and the bugler, buglers were a critical success because that noise is what brought people over. And then Parker would go stand on his soapbox or out on the uh, tongue of his wagon and start professing the benefits of dental health. Um, when he did his extractions, uh, he would uh, stomp on a, an elevated stage that served as a sounding board. And as the critical moment where it would be most painful occurred, he would stomp his foot and the band would crescendo, crescendo and he would mask out the, the screams of the patient. Pretty wise. Okay. So uh, this was an interesting quote from uh, Franklin Roosevelt. If I were going to start over again, I'm inclined to think that going to advertising. Uh, the general raising of the standards of modern civilization among all groups of people during the past half century would have been impossible without spreading the knowledge and higher standards by means of advertising. So it was late arriving as far as dentistry was concerned about advertising uh, what you did and what we did, but I believe in the 1970s, late 1970s, early 80s, um, the American Dental Association started doing public service announcements to try to keep practitioners from going out and advertising on their own. And they would do things like uh, smile, get it at your dentist regularly, and you should take care of your teeth uh, uh, for, you know, for the lifetime of use. So Parker believed that patients avoided dentistry because of pain and ignorance, and they would procrastinate, uh, and they had a lack of money. So he sought to eliminate all that. Uh, he felt that fear was the strongest uh, detriment to care, so that's why he uh, advertised his uh, techniques as painless. Um, he developed hydrocaine, which was a dilute anesthetic of cocaine, and he aggressively advertised his surfaces, services. Um, he also used a great deal of alcohol. So he would give the people a hydrocaine, uh, get them tanked up, and then extract their teeth. Uh, he reportedly removed 357 teeth in a day on a vaudeville stage, and he had those teeth strong, and he wore them around his neck as a necklace. Uh, in his latter years, he developed 28 West Coast dental offices that grossed more than $3 million annually in the early 20th century. Now, if you delve more closely into that, um, Parker was hiring young dentists right out of school, a la American Dental. Can I say that, or are we going to get into trouble with the law? <laughs> with some of the other uh, large groups. And um, the wives of these young dentists objected to the fact that they were ridiculed because their husband worked for an advertising dentist. So as it got more and more difficult, as people would hide away their faces on leaving the office, uh, Parker started hiring impaired dentists uh, to give them a second chance. So uh, he was ahead of his time in that regard as well. Uh, he began his career in New Brunswick, Canada, and his hometown province was a uh, seafaring village, as I said. Uh, over his career, he had offices between uh, New York and California, all over the West Coast. 
A lot of times uh, he moved around because of loss or forfeiture of licensure. Um, he would uh, rent a room in a nearby town and, um, and then he'd hit the street to pedal dentistry. Again, he didn't like the sterile atmosphere of the dental parlor. He felt the best way to show people what they needed was to get out among them, okay, be uh, a showman. Um, he promised people that he would extract their teeth for 50 cents and that if he hurt them, he would give them $5. Now, he has said, or he did say, that he never parted with that $5. But, you know, you got dancing girls and hydrocaine and alcohol, you probably wouldn't have to. Um, completely painless extractions were promised, uh, as I said, the $5 guarantee. And the narcotic worked, money flowed, and um, he would borrow a rocking chair uh, for the waiting patients wherever he went so they could be in comfort uh, while they waited. Uh, here's the area where he's from. This is called the Bay of Fundy here. Let me see. Step away here. In around this area. It's called the Canadian Maritimes. I guess St. Uh, uh, Martin's is in there somewhere. But you can see that it uh, lends itself to a, a seafaring lifestyle. And his family was engaged in the shipbuilding business. And I think they were disappointed in the fact that um, Parker was largely looking for something uh, where he could make a living and not exert a whole lot of effort. Um, there's the postcard photos there. There's Parker when he's in his 80s, it's just before his uh, death. Uh, there's his uh, necklace of 357 teeth. And uh, he's also wearing a beaver fur hat. Uh, this was from his early days traveling across Canada, out through the West. Uh, the beaver hat actually has three bullet holes in it because he offended an evangelical minister uh, with his, you know, barking uh, the same way the uh, evangelical minister was. And I guess the minister felt he was taking away patrons from him, and he uh, let Parker know it. He shot him in the hat rather than the head. <laughs> so, um, occasionally you'll see his name listed as Edgar R. R. Parker, to be railroaded. Uh, but his name was actually Edward, I'm sorry, Edgar Randolph Parker. Some people incorporate a Rudolph with it, Edgar Rudolph Rand, Randolph Parker, which is difficult to say. Um, I said he was born in 1872 and around that time, five or seven years after the American Civil War and the uh, Canadian Confederation, struggled in primary school. And this was probably because he was dyslexic. It horribly embarrassed his mother and she had to go speak with his sisters. He could not recite the ABCs forwards, but he could do it backwards. And, you know, he could knock that drunk test out of the park. They ever stopped him. But uh, I don't know whether that ever happened or not. Um, the fact that he embarrassed his mother uh, probably impacted his relationship with his parents greatly. Uh, he felt they were ashamed of him. He uh, valued appearance over ability. Uh, he always felt that he liked the way doctors looked because they strode around in the white coats and that all-knowing air. So he figured he could do that, okay, without much effort. Um, he became a seafarer uh, again in his journey throughout uh, trying to make a living. Uh, he was uh, jailed in South America. He got into a number of fights. And as you can imagine, if you've ever been a brawler, uh, while you do fight a lot, sometimes you have to learn to talk your way out of the fight. And Parker was adept at that as well. His dental education began in New York at the College of Dentistry there. It was also adjacent to a homeopathic school, so he kept that knowledge and used that knowledge in his discussions about preventive dentistry. Uh, the dental school structure at the time allowed students to go out and peddle some of what they'd learned to help them with their education, to help them with their equipment purchases. And uh, ba after a couple of weeks in his going out and cleaning teeth, uh, he decided that if he could get the cook to let him in the door, uh, he'd had her. 
and he'd start to work on the lady of the house. Uh, when problems arose that they had not yet been covered in dental school, he told them, wait, I'll be back in a couple of weeks after we cover that, okay? He made that guarantee. Uh, he was expelled from dental school after about six weeks for moonlighting. So in 1890, he enrolled in the Philadelphia Dental College, and Dr. Lehman and I were talking about that. Um, uh, Philadelphia seemed to be the hotbed for health sciences education, uh, both med medical school and dentistry. Um, he um, has, um, uh, education was consisted of about two years of didactic and clinical instruction. And then there was like an apprenticeship with an established dentist following graduation. And that was much the same education that I talked about when we discussed uh, John Henry Holliday, uh, a Doc Holliday, uh, who also went to dental school in Philadelphia. Um, Edgar graduated with just three other students because he missed his major graduation. He was one of the holdovers. And he actually had to beg his dean for the diploma because the dean felt that his class attendance did not come up to par to have a sufficient knowledge to be able to graduate. Um, so that the bargaining and the begging actually got him the dental degree, but he said the only reason I was absent is because I had to make a living. Okay? Here's his graduation picture. He said he grew a mustache so he would look more distinguished, and that gets back into that sum and substance thing. He felt appearance was much more important than actually knowing something. Here's his dental diploma to prove he actually did graduate. So the Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery, uh, faculty left to establish the Philadelphia Dental College and later Penn. Notable alumni of the Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery were John Henry Holliday and Edward Hartley Angle. We've heard a talk about Angle orthodontics before. And the Philadelphia Dental College became Temple School of Dentistry. And the notable alumni were uh, Edgar Parker and, of course, Dr. Musica. In 19th century dentistry, uh, it was a time of patent medicines. Uh, there was artful advertising, questionable benefit. Early dentistry in the U.S. was a freewheeling business. Anybody could do it. Uh, most dentists were not college educated. Barbers did it. As I said, farriers did it. There were a few U.S. dental schools. Uh, there was born in Baltimore in 1839, uh, Pennsylvania 1856, and Atlanta Southern in 1887, Northwestern in 1889. Um, they basically learned the trade as an apprentice with an experienced practitioner. And uh, like I said, people with uh, very little training would decide that they wanted to begin or wanted to begin to extract teeth. And they would because they could make money at it and they would get people out of pain. Uh, they were itinerant. They largely traveled about in, on horseback or in buggy. And uh, the dentistry was unregulated and quite risky and oral health promotion was limited in scope. So here are some of those early wagons. If you saw Django, who was one of the dentists that was riding around with the mobile tooth on the top. But um, they were usually uh, very brightly painted to gather people's attention. There might be bells or visual objects that moved to gather people uh, around when they pulled up. Um, Parker initially tried to practice in an ethical fashion. Uh, per the pro professional standards of the time, which was you did not tell people that you were going to perform painless dentistry on them, or you did not guarantee cosmetic dentistry. What you did is you worked on your patients, and your patient satisfaction would, you know, lead patients to you by word of mouth. Now, the interesting thing about that, um, there were several people at the time who said, well, wait a minute. Don't flowers have a marvelous aroma to attract the bees? And don't male birds have this beautiful plumage to attract female mates? And so there was this sort of odd dichotomy of thought. Um, he toured the western provinces, and that beaver top hat was a relic of the time, uh, as we've seen earlier. In 1897, he perched a property in Brooklyn on Flatbush Avenue. And he had this really ostentatious signage, as you'll see here. And it's over in the book, uh, Malvin Ring's book, that you can see. So I am absolutely positively painless, and he have all these little testimonials around it. Now, what you should note is this looks a great deal like P.T. Barnum's American Museum, where he had the uh, 
colorful, ostentatious display of what was going on inside. So here's an, exa an example of parlor dentistry. Uh, it looks very stodgy, very sterile, very stoic. Of course, there's the Three Stooges. I love the Three Stooges. Most women don't. Never understood that. I thought the Three Stooges were hilarious. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, Parker hired an ex-manager of P.T. Barnum, uh, William Beebe, and uh, together they developed the Painless Parker Dental Circus, and that's what would travel around the town and gather people around to drum up business. Again, he had a lot of oddities that traveled with him so that he could garner attention as he pulled up. And um, the patients lined up, he'd give them a little alcohol, he'd give them that hydrocaine solution, and they'd be well lubricated by the time they actually made it to his chair. Um, all the while this was going on, if he needed to distract attention from what was going on on stage, he had the dancing girls and he had that band crescendo. Uh, here's a, a modern day reenactor showing someone standing on the soapbox and purporting their, uh, oil, their wares. Usually uh, these were considered the snake oil salesmen. Uh, which was a, a, a derivative of some root and not actually uh, reptile venom, which I thought was unfortunate. You know, reptile venom isn't really toxic. You can drink it. It doesn't taste very good. You just don't want to inject it. Okay. Uh, here's his bucket of teeth. It's famous. I think it's still in the museum at Temple. And there's also his 357 teeth on a necklace that he wore. Um, when I was in the Army, we used to take out wisdom teeth. And if you've ever taken out wisdom teeth, they're impacted. They're pretty pristine. And if you threw them in hypochlorite, they would get pearly white. And we could make necklaces and bracelets out of them. They look pretty good. <laughs> Here's Parker and one of his advertisements. And he's got uh, an advocation for preventive health. Here's uh, self-congratulatory messages that are put out. And is also a reprint from Time Magazine that talks about the virtues of preventive dentistry. In 1912, he left New York and headed to Los Angeles, California, because his partner, Bibi, had died. He was a little bit depressed. Um, unfortunately, when he left New York, there were a lot of dissatisfied patients who had been promised things. Uh, they were left in his wake. So, uh, he could have been charged with patient abandonment because of uh, what he had done. But if you look back historically, I cannot find a malpractice suit against Parker. Now, I found some um, litigation regarding properties that he was trying to purchase, but nothing about a malpractice suit. Uh, he used airplanes uh, to tow those advertising banners around, like you see at football games or at the beach. And he used educational films about oral hygiene, had a nationally syndicated call-in radio show about dentistry. So this guy was uh, really, really out to uh, promote knowledge in dentistry. But at the same time, there's sort of this uh, shameless self-aggrandizement. Here's some of his dental products, which he peddled. Uh, in his latter years, he was more an entrepreneurial dentist and actually oversaw the practice of uh, those, you know, 70 people who worked with him. Uh, this harkens back to those patent medicines, you know, with the brightly colored labels and the, the bold printing and the uh, promises of uh, fixed teeth stay fixed. In California, you know, you go out to the West where there's a little bit of a laid back attitude. Uh, people are more interested in um, um, sort of visuals than they are uh, actual uh, abilities. Uh, he treated zoo animals, uh, and there's a picture of that over there as well. He called it hippodontia. He had photo ops with celebrities, and uh, he was engaged in shameless self-promotion. So around this time, uh, local dental boards were getting tired of his claim to be painless, and um, that pressure from the dental board caused him to legally change his name to Painless. So he did that in 1915. Uh, his business flourished. He opened a number of dental practices. At the time of his death, he owned 28 practices, and he employed 70 dentists, and he grossed $3 million annually. He was quite successful in that regard. Okay. 
Uh, he had a trade card printed and it said, my real name is Painless Parker. Notice no quotes. Uh, as I was affectionately called Painless Parker by patients and fellow workers, I had my name legally changed September 15, 1915, signed Painless Parker. And then um, there was actually a photo of him within the trade card that was when he was 76 years of age. Uh, as far as his view of himself, he felt he was a visionary, a patient advocate, a crusader within the profession. He wasn't born Painless Parker, but he became him, as told by Dr. Christian. Uh, he was shaped by an amalgamation, my term, okay, <laughs> uh, of his environment as an experience. And Dr. Christian said there were three developmental and professional milestones. Uh, his formative time growing up in the Canadian Maritimes, his education and strong opinions that were developed on the U.S. East Coast in his dental education and also subsequent practice in New York. And then later, the West Coast laid back attitude allowed him to flourish because the uh, flamboyancy and the self-promotion was well accepted uh, on the West Coast. His legacy, uh, of course, advertising dentistry, education in public health, access to care, like if the people can't come to you, go to them, affordable care, and of course, entrepreneurial dentistry. This is uh, Bob Hope and Jane Russell from a film that was called The Pale Face. Uh, Bob Hope uh, was Peter Painless Potter, and he was an adent a tenor dentist in the film. There was also another film that was loosely based on Parker's life. I believe it was called Greed, and I don't know whether we have Film Institute aficionados in here, but it's one, one of the AFI top thousand or something, but it was supposed to be well done. Uh, it talked about what people would do, uh, you know, to uh, sort of line their pockets. And the, um, the protagonist in the, in the movie was someone named McTeague, who was a dentist, who I guess was greedy. Okay. Here's his headstone. Um, it's in uh, Santa Clara County, California, and you can see it's uh, Edgar Randolph Parker. Uh, he lived to be 80 years old, and that's all. Do I have any questions about what I've discussed? Yes, sir. Since we want both people present and also anybody who's, who views this later, and the, many of these presentations are well viewed, um, I'm going to br bring you a microphone so we can get the question as well as the answer, because you've all been in situations where you go, it would have made more sense if I'd had known what the person was responding to. So somebody, there was a hand went up. I was curious to know if you know how he administered the hydrocaine. Um, even though Halstead blocks were available in the 1870s, uh, he had them drink it. He had them drink it. Yeah, uh, it was uh, sort of a dilute cocaine. And you'll have to remember, was it uh, 1905, I think Coca-Cola finally took cocaine out of their syrup. And uh, I don't know when Bayer took heroin out of their cough syrup. It was a sad day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. In 1907, the U.S. Pure Food and Drug Acts started where the patent medicines were told, m makers were told, first of all, you have to prove that, you know, what, you're, uh, what you are curing, but you also have to state what's in the medicine and what's in, and by implication, what's not there. So. so no more hallucinogenics after 1907? It took a while for it actually to ha everything to happen, but that's when a lot of that started. After all, if you've got a pain, if you are saying, well, the child has colic, we'll, we'll cure it with this uh, medicine, patent medicine, and if it's full of alcohol, well, the Assuming the baby doesn't die, the baby is going to be sleeping quite a, wh a while. <laughs> so um, Melissa and John and I were talking earlier about the patent medicines, and there are actually some still around today. Uh, Absorbing Junior, BC powders, Goodies powders, Bayer aspirin. Um, 
a lot of the uh, liniments, muscle relaxants, joint ailments and all uh, were actually part of Chinese medicine when we talked about the connection of the U.S. East Coast and West Coast railways. Uh, a lot of the workers were Chinese and they used these patent medicines on sore joints and sore muscles and that's where Absorbine Jr. comes from. Which is what? It's like menthol or camphor or something? Yeah. It's really pungent. <laughs> Yes. I'm curious to know whether we should take him seriously or not, or if the way he promoted dental health makes him a, a real dentist. I don't know exactly how to put it, but I kind of feel ambiguous. Right. The, the way you presented it, you make fun of him in one sense, and yet he, well, did, he may have done some good things. Absolutely. In retrospect, okay? At the time, he was vilified. When I was in school, uh, and people of my vintage were in school, uh, advertising was forbidden. Uh, the faculty would ridicule people who advertised, and it's like it was un unwritten that you just didn't do that. Now. They interviewed the dean of, uh, what is it, Kornberg now, Temple? And he actually vilified Parker. He said he was a charlatan. He was not a good dentist, okay? But I think you have to remember that line from Unforgiven, where the good aren't always so good and the bad aren't always so bad. So he did accomplish some good things. I mean, if you look at that bucket of teeth, you won't find a pristine tooth in there. Those teeth had large, curious lesions, all of them. So he wasn't removing teeth willy-nilly. I'm curious about the nature of his 70 dental practices like in California. Were these more legitimized uh, dental offices or were these kind of storefront on the street corner um, offices? These were like, uh, like what we see today, the American Dental Center, okay? They're like uh, storefront dental shops, yes. But they were fixed facilities and the dentist actual work there. Yep. And it was and 28 trouble. practices and 70 dentists. 70 dentists. Not 70 practices. Right, it's 28 practices. <clears throat> I was just going to say, actually, a, a version of that very same thing goes on in North Carolina right now. I don't know if you all realize it, but <clears throat> a, a small handful of dentists across the country have taken it upon themselves to start practices and hire other dentists to do the dentistry, and then they buy existing practices and keep the dentist on to, to keep doing the dentistry, and there's one practice like that in Raleigh that I would say by this time he's got 15 or 16 practices. And you know they've got they've got uh, quality control and peer review and you know they pay for continuing education. Precisely, for, it's you know, a it's a first class operation. I have no idea that that Painless Parker you know played much of a role in trying to maintain the quality of what was being done. Sure. But you know the the uh, concept goes on today. Sure. Just out of curiosity. Um, you said, you know, the stationary offices were pretty sterile and staid. That, of course, raises the question, when you operate out of a horse-drawn carriage, mm -hmm. what happens to infection control of any kind? <laughs> there isn't even a that's, sink to wash your hands. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, and, and you figure, okay, what's done with the instruments? They're probably rinsing them in that same ethanol that they use for sedating the patients. If, if anybody's ever seen the street dentists that operate in third world countries, you'll see that they clean their instruments with the same thing they draw up in the syringe and inject people. Did he have any heirs? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. the, the daughter they interviewed uh, was, I guess, his only existing heir. And she had the family farm. And uh, there were a lot of artifacts in the barn that went to Temple University. But they also went to a museum in, uh, in Arizona. And I don't know whether that museum is still open or not. And the second question, were dentists at that time, I guess it's twofold. A, were dentists at the time required to have malpractice insurance? And secondly, um, they weren't? It was a different time. Okay. 
because yeah, he'd probably be very difficult to cover. Yeah. <laughs> and, and people weren't as litigious then. Right, right. Yeah. Everything was on a handshake. Thank you for your attention.